Okay, g'day all, welcome to another video. Um, so a little bit of business before we get started. Uh, there's a What's A Creel Patreon page, so if you're interested in supporting these videos, uh, head over to the page in the video description. Yeah, cheers. And the other thing is I've, I've made a couple of games and put them up on the Windows Store, so if you're interested in uh, either buying or paying the free versions, versions of Scomp or Intergalactic Memory, um, I reckon they're worth playing, but I don't know, I might be biased. <laughs> Okay, so the topics for today. This is a difficult, difficult tutorial to record. I tell you what, I've been at this for five hours so far today. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this will be the last take. It just, it hasn't worked so far, but we'll see. Um, the topics for today are mutexes, spin locks, and critical sections. Uh, it's, it's a little bit weird, but we're going to implement these three things, these three mechanisms, in, uh, in assembly. And, and what's weird to me about this is that, that often when you get introduced to mutexes, you'll kind of be told that they, that they are spin locks or, or, that they, or that they always guard critical sections and this sort of thing. So there's a little bit of confusion as to exactly what these things are, and I hope that I can clear that a little bit today. Um, this is not a general introduction to mutexes, although I think the level that we're going to be implementing this mutex and spin lock uh, will kind of show people certainly a different side of, of what, a, what a mutex actually is. Um, I do hope later on to introduce a new series with um, general descriptions in a higher level language of semaphores and mutexes. Um, and just problem solving in uh, parallel programming in general. So if you're interested in that, please leave, leave a comment and uh, tell me because that'll probably um, just encourage me to make it sooner. Alrighty, but I do want to describe those topics in more detail than we are today, or just on a different level uh, in their own series. Okay, so the first word that we're uh, looking at today, the mutex. Um, a mutex is a parallel primitive, um, which means just it's... It's an abstract data type that, that helps us in uh, parallel programming. And the idea of mutexes has been around for a really long time, but they were officially named as a parallel primitive by Edsger Dijkstra, who also gave us the shunting yard algorithm. He gave us semaphores and Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path first. I mean, the guy is just brilliant, really. He's just brilliant. Um, but a mutex is an abstract data type that only allows one thread to own it at once. So the name comes from mutually exclusive and all that we're saying is that if one thread owns the mutex, if one thread has or grabs the mutex, then none of the other threads can, can own it. Yeah, so that's why it's mutually exclusive. Um, okay, so the second word that we talked about at the start was uh, spin locks. What is a spin lock? Well, when one thread grabs a mutex, uh, a second thread might come along and try to grab that mutex. Now, it can't grab it. Only one thread can own a mutex at once. So what does the second thread do? Well, one of the most obvious things that the second thread could do is just spin. Just make a loop, go round and round in circles, and uh, literally do nothing but spin until the mutex is free. This use of a mutex, where the threads come along and spin to wait for the mutex, is called a spin. Spin lock. I, I hope that makes sense. So a spin lock is a particular way of using a mutex. Yeah, it's what a thread does when it can't get the mutex. Does that, does that kind of gel? I, I hope so. It's, it's hard to explain, but that's what a spin lock is, and we're going to make one in a minute, so <laughs> hopefully it makes sense by then. Um, spin locks are just a, a single tool. Yeah, you can do lots of different things with uh, mutexes. Yeah, mutexes aren't spin locks, and spin locks aren't mutexes. Yeah, but they, they, you know, it's just a tool that doesn't solve every problem. Uh, one of the problems that it does help solve, or one of the situations where we can use a mutex uh, in this spin lock kind of mechanism, uh, is for a critical section. So we can make uh, a spin lock guard a critical section. Yeah, so right here, this is a sort of quasi C++ code. Mind you, I forgot to put a semicolon on the end of this uh, function, so it's not, not actually C++, but... The objective is that you'd have a bunch of threads trying to execute this function, some function, uh, at the same time. But you want to make sure that only one thread can enter this, this comment section here, this critical section of code. And if any other threads try and get past this enter critical section function just here, 
while there's already a thread in the critical section, well, they're going to block. They're going to spin lock. Yeah. So that's, that's a critical section just there. And what happens is that, that once one thread leaves the critical section, so it comes down here to, to this leave critical section, then we're going to do something in this function um, that will let the other threads know that they can um, squabble amongst themselves and figure out which thread should go next into the critical section. So the point is that in the critical section, we're guaranteed that there's only one thread at once, which is very, very nice because it means there's no race conditions. Okay. A bit of a diagram. I just got out my pen and gimp the other day and thought I might draw a little room with really cool perspective. Um, the critical section is a bit like a room with a key and a, and a lockable door. Um, the mutex is like this key and the lock. Yeah, so a thread can come along, it can grab the key and it can lock itself inside the critical section. And then whenever another thread comes along, uh, if the key's not available, if it's inside the critical section, then that thread can do whatever it wants. But if it's a spin lock that we've made, that thread will just spin. It'll just stand outside the door and wait, doing nothing useful. I hope that makes a bit of sense. So just a summary of all three terms. Uh, a mutex is like a lock and a key, and only one thread, or one of the threads which, which shares the mutex, can actually own the lock and the key at once. Um, with a mutex, we can create a spin lock. So spin lock is sort of more what the other threads will do when they see that the mutex is not available. And we can use a spin lock to guard a critical section. Yeah, that's the three terms in summary just there. I hope that makes a bit of sense. Um, all right, so I wouldn't quite be right without mentioning that uh, we're coming up pretty fast uh, to be you know, face to face with another parallel hazard, the, uh, the deadlock. Um, if one mutex grabs, sorry, if one thread grabs a mutex and then retires without letting go of the mutex, um, any other thread that comes up in a spin lock to grab that mutex will um, just spin forever. Yeah, because the thread that owns the mutex is dead. It's gone. Um, that's a deadlock just there. Yeah, if you're waiting on a parallel primitive and the parallel primitive for logical reasons can't be released, then you're going to wait forever. Yeah, it's deadlock. Um, the other time that, the dead, that a deadlock might come about is if you have a thread that grabs a mutex and then for one reason or another, the same thread tries to grab the mutex again. Uh, it's going to be sitting there spinning, waiting for itself to release the mutex. And, you know, it's a strange way to program and you've probably got a deadlock again. Um, okay, so it seems like a pretty easy situation to avoid this deadlock, but I did want to mention it because very soon um, things do become more complicated and, and you do have to be really, really careful um, when you're using these sorts of structures, these mutexes and things that you don't cause a deadlock. Alrighty, so let's make a mutex, shall we? Um, let's make a mutex and a spin lock and a critical section. When, when a thread approaches a critical section of code, there's only two possibilities. Um, either the door is open and the key is available, or the door is locked and the key is inside. So maybe some thread is already in the critical section. So if you think about it, a single bit could be used to store the state of a mutex. And you could use a bunch of different data types, but byte is the most conservative. What we're actually going to be using is a, is a word, 16-bit word. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how do we create a mutex? So that's the question. Uh, how do we create a mutex with a spin lock? We know about the lock prefix from last video, but, but there's, a little, there's a little catch here. We can't, we can't use multiple instructions to create this mutex and spin lock. So if we used something like compare and ink, so we compare and see if the mutex is free, then we increment the mutex if it is, we can't do something like that because those two instructions together are not atomic. Yeah, one thread might perform the compare and think that the mutex is free, but at that exact time, another thread might come along and do the compare as well. And what we'd end up with then is two threads that have grabbed the mutex and two threads would go into the critical section and we could have race conditions. So to implement a mutex spin lock, what we actually want is a special instruction that tests and sets the state of the mutex in one atomic step. Um, and there's plenty of them in uh, x86. BTS is one of them, probably the most simple. So 
bit test and set it stands for and what the instruction does is it tests a bit by copying it to the carry flag but at the same time in an atomic step uh, it also sets the bit to one okay so it takes two operands the first is a pointer to what's called like a, 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 a bit string base and the second operand is the bit number to test so mutex just here would be a word pointer yeah um, I, I think it could be a D word pointer as well but it can't be a byte uh, but what we're saying just here with lock BTS mutex 0 is check what bit number 0 is set to in this mutex variable just here and save that as the carry flag whatever it's set to 0 or 1 um, but also set it to 1 regardless of what it was yeah so these three lines just here there's three simple little lines this my friends is a spin lock <laughs> good stuff okay we're getting somewhere we're getting somewhere uh, why does this work well it's just a carry flag really if you think about it lock BTS mutex zero is is gonna do one or two things it's either gonna set the carry flag to zero um, which would mean that prior to the instruction the carry flag no the the bit that we're testing was zero uh, or it's gonna set the carry flag to one which would mean that some other thread already has the mutex and uh, this thread should spin until the mutex is released so all you've really got to do is um, JC jump on the carry flag after the atomic BTS um, alrighty there's a whole whole bunch of other instructions you could use as well we're not going to go through those we might look at them a bit later but you can use other instructions other than BTS to make um, parallel primitives and the other thing that I should mention is that this spin lock is only one usage of a mutex um, you can do lots of different things so there's other locks called readers writer lock which allow multiple readers in but only one writer into the critical section um, and there's other things that you could do as well you don't have to spin you know if you've got a a queue of jobs um, you might just send your thread off to do some other job yeah it's completely up to the application really um, alrighty so we're gonna get to coding in just a minute just give this a quick read and uh, that's what we're gonna be doing so I might just pause the video and I'll get back to you in a second okay well here we are in Visual Studio and uh, I've changed things around just a little uh, I did include time.h at the top of my file and I'm making five threads here and they're all gonna run a function that we'll look at in just a second uh, but the other important thing I'm trying to do here is um, just show the performance difference between locks instructions and regular instructions using our critical section so start time uh, yeah take a clock a reading of the clock at the start take a reading of the clock when all five threads finish and yeah we'll see the performance of them um, so I'm making five threads just here and they're all incrementing this shared variable J it's not a good example I know and I'm sorry I couldn't think of anything better but I think it's gonna be a, an illustrative example so yeah maybe that's good I don't know <laughs> um, execute work is where the uh, threads eventuate so after they've been created uh, all five threads are gonna jump here to execute work uh, where all five of them are gonna try and increment that J variable um, 10 million times so all going to plan we should end up with 50 million in the final result in J unless there's race conditions or terrible things uh, in interfering with us um, so let's give it a shot this is just using the lock prefix let's see what sort of time we get there it is okay so eight six four I think a thousand is a millisecond yeah so this is in milliseconds here the clock gives us the time in milliseconds um, eight six four is just shy of a second yeah so if I just make a note of that up the top here, um, 864 is the time to beat. That's with locked instructions. Um, now, I'm not really sure why they are slower, but they are much slower than uh, regular instructions, as we're about to see, because we're going to implement a critical section. It might be that the operating system is interleaving the threads having one thread execute this line then putting it to sleep and then having a second thread execute this line and put it to sleep but I don't think that's what it is uh, I think it's just that the lock prefix makes an instruction ten times slower yeah so you want to avoid using it as much as you can 
which is why you make critical sections. So I'm just going to say spin loop. I might just get rid of this rubbish here. Well, just delete it. Um, let's make ourselves a mutex. Uh, mutex dw and zero. This is our mutex. Um, okay, so it's just a word, 16 bits. Set it to zero at the start to mean that the mutex mutex is uh, up for grabs. And this is the spin loop down here. So lock BTS mutex zero. And JC, jump if the carry flag was uh, one, because that means another thread is already in the critical section. So JC to spin loop. And these three lines of code just here are a spin lock with a mutex. Beautiful. Um, the other thing that we got to remember, and this is this is so important, we'll get a deadlock otherwise. Um, here's the critical section just here. Um, we know that we've got the mutex with this particular thread if we can get past this JC just here without uh, spinning. So this is the critical section down here. After the critical section, um, we've got a mov mutex zero. Release the mutex. And I'm just going to... Yeah, if you don't release the mutex, then um, this thread's going to jump back up to the top and it's going to start waiting on its own mutex. And all of the other threads are going to be waiting for it to finish, um, you know, release the mutex. And you're just going to have deadlock, so it's not going to work. Okay, but the critical section. Inside the critical section, we might actually increment our variable j 1,000 times instead of one uh, iteration per loop. So... Or instead of instead of using lock like we did a minute ago, incrementing it one each time. So mov uh, dx uh, thousand. Uh, I might call it inner loop. Um, inc. It's going to be I think d word PCR could be q word. I think it's d word. Uh, RCX. Uh, d uh, dx and jump not zero to inner loop. Um, okay, so we'll just use RDX as a little inner counter there and we'll perform our increments 1,000 at a time. Yeah, obviously just there you could just add uh, 1,000 to RCX, but I'm trying to show how slow lock is here. So, yeah, just bear with me. It's worth it. And the other thing, after we've finished uh, with our mutex and we've left the critical section, um, which is down here, uh, we have left the critical section. Um, a thread leaves the critical section the moment that it drops the mutex, which is setting the mutex to zero for us. And we actually want to sub uh, RAX 1000. And jump not zero to spin loop. Yeah, so we don't have to worry about race conditions with RAX because each thread has its own RAX. Mm. Uh, I hope that makes a bit of sense. So this is a spin lock up the top here. Um, this is a critical section down here, which is guarded by that spin lock. And at the end, we've always got to remember to release our mutex. Let's see what sort of speed gain we can have. Well, would you look at that? One, three, three. Would you look at that? Okay, so that's much, much faster. Yeah, that's much faster. Our original using locked instructions to increment all 50 million uh, took 864. Yeah, and um, just with a, with, a, with a little change and a spin lock and a critical section, we can um, increment 1,000 times uninterrupted and, 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 and more importantly, without having to use this slow locked instruction all the time. I hope that was useful for an introduction of uh, how to how to make whatever we just made and um, good luck you know have a good day see us